All right. So today we will begin the discussion on uh, a free particle. So ideally, this should be the simplest case of all, uh, because a free particle, by definition, is something upon which there is no force acting. Yeah. So a free particle basically means that there is no force. And in other words, there is no potential acting on the particle. So the particle is basically moving in a force-free force region. So the potential, uh, maybe I should write V of X equal to zero, okay? All right. So classically, what does this mean? Classically, if force is zero, then Newton's second law tells you that m d square x dt square is zero, which tells you that dx over dt, which is the velocity, is a constant. So it's just moving with some constant velocity. So we will look at the analogous situation in the case of single particle quantum mechanics. We will discover that, uh, somewhat surprisingly, the case of the free particle, which is the simplest case in classical mechanics, has a couple of subtleties that one has to understand quite carefully. So we will, in this module, we will go through what these subtleties are after we finish the formal uh, solution of the Schrodinger equation in this case. So remember the program. What is the program? The program is your goal is to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, right? But you can take recourse to separable solutions, separable solutions, which lets you write your psi of x comma t as some function of space alone and some function of time alone. And the function of time is actually easily derived, and this is nothing but psi of x times e to the minus i e t over h bar. Right? These are what are called stationary states. So the general solution, general solution, psi of x comma t, is a general linear superposition of all these specific solutions given by the stationary state, right? So one has to look at what the coefficients C and R and fix C N by initial condition, right? So you know that psi of x comma zero is given to you is some function f of x, right? So you can use this information to understand what C N is because the psi n's are orthogonal functions, right? So we basically demand that f of x, which is psi of x comma zero, is um, this guy that I have given in the square bracket. So this is, sorry, not the, so the summation. So this is equal to n c n psi n of x, right? Basically, I'm putting time t equal to zero in the previous equation. Now, if you multiply both sides by psi n star and integrate, f of x, psi m star of x dx, integration equals in some cn, integral psi m star psi n dx, but this is nothing but the Kronecker delta, so the right hand side is cm. So this formula gives you a nice way of fixing what the expansion coefficients are for the general solution, because you know what the uh, initial condition is. So this is the general program of solving the Schrodinger equation given a potential. So this is the program that we will follow. The first job for us is to understand what the psi n of x are, right? And the psi n of x you can get by solving the time independent Schrodinger equation. Time independent Schrodinger equation, which of course is minus h bar square over 2m. D square psi dx square plus v of x psi of x equals e psi of x. So this is the time independent Schrodinger equation. Of course, in the case of a free particle where v of x is zero everywhere, this equation reduces to d square psi dx square 
equals e psi, which I can rearrange as d square psi over dx square equals minus 2me over h bar square times psi. Okay, a simple rearrangement. And you guys rec recognize what this equation is. It's a famous simple harmonic equation. So I'll call this uh, quantity in the brackets as some k square. So I can rewrite this equation as d square psi over dx square is minus k square psi, where k square is a positive quantity to a mu over h bar square. So the solution for this is also very obvious to you. This is something that we have done many times in this course. So this is nothing but psi of x equals a p e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k x. Simple enough. So we have understood what the solution of the time independent Schrodinger equation is, right? So we can simply tack on the time dependence, which is e to the minus i e t over h bar, and write down what psi of x comma t would be. Psi of x comma t would be a e to the i k x times e to the minus i e t over h bar plus b e to the minus i k x e to the minus i e t over h bar. But we know what e is in this case because of this particular relation. So I can rearrange the boxed equation and write e as h bar square k square over 2m. So I can write my psi of x comma t as a e to the i k times x minus h bar k over 2m times t plus b e to the minus i k x plus h bar k over 2m times t, okay? So this would be my psi of x comma t tacking on the time dependence. So notice that this is a wave, right? So remember that in the electrodynamics module, we uh, discussed that any function of x and t which depends on x and t only through the combination x plus minus vt is a wave, right? So here we have a e to the i k x minus h bar k over 2m times t. So if I can associate h bar k over 2m, and if you can work out the dimensions, this will have the dimensions of velocity v, then, <coughs> excuse me, I can write my psi of x comma t as a e to the i k x minus v t plus b e to the minus i k x plus v t, right? So the first would represent a wave that is traveling to the right and the second would represent a wave that is traveling to the left. But actually I can combine these two into one single mathematical solution. So remember that in our definition, k is manifestly positive, but if I can allow k to run over both positive and negative integers, so not integers, positive and negative values, for example, instead of defining k as square root of 2me over h bar, suppose if I write, uh, if I define k as plus minus square root of 2me over h bar, then I can write the above solution, psi of x comma t, as simply a exponential i k x minus v t, which is h bar k over 2m times t. Okay, if this looks confusing, don't worry. All we have done is, see, equation one and equation two are identical. In equation one, k is manifestly positive, so I have to represent the wave that is traveling to the left and the wave that is traveling to the right as separate terms. But in equation two, I have combined this by making k both positive and negative, 
right? So if you can call the positive values as k plus and the negative values as k minus, then this decomposes into a e to the i k plus x minus v t, a e to the minus i k minus x plus v t. So it's exactly the same as equation one. So k greater than zero is a wave traveling to the right and k less than zero is a wave traveling to the left, okay? So this last step is completely unnecessary. You can simply work with the equation one. This is just for convenience, okay? All right, so mathematically everything seems to check out. There is uh, absolutely no problem. So we can write down what these stationary states are. We can uh, we know what the separable solution is and we can construct the most general solution. But there's a couple of issues. The first obvious issue is the fact that this wave that we have written down is not normalizable, okay? So the wave function is not normalizable. Okay, why is it not normalizable? Well, look at psi star psi. Psi star psi would simply be mod a square. And if I integrate this between minus infinity and infinity, obviously I'll get some nonsensical result. So the wave function is not normalizable between minus infinity and infinity, which means the probability is not conserved. But if you're really careful and, uh, and looking at the uh, discussion here and comparing it to the program there, you would actually uh, catch me and claim that I'm not doing something quite right. What I'm not actually doing yet is taking the summation over n, okay? Obviously, there is no summation over n in this case. There, is, there are no boundary conditions. And so your uh, uh, energy values are not discrete, uh, unlike in the particle in a box case, where you had two boundary conditions that made k a discrete integer, which necessarily made the energy also a discrete variable. In this case, there are no boundary conditions. There is no boundaries, it's free space. The particle can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So nothing can make uh, energies and k's discrete. So it's a continuous variable. But if it is a continuous variable, I should replace the sum over n by some kind of an integration. So that part I've still not done. And this is the part that will end up saving this whole normalization later. But for now, notice that the equation two that I have written down as a formal solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation is not a normalizable wave function for obvious reasons. But there is also something uh, a little peculiar about the uh, velocity of this wave. So remember, so that velocity of this wave from equation two is basically h bar k over 2m. Right, let me call this vqm, the quantum mechanical velocity associated with the particle. I'm assuming that this is associated with the particle, right? So what is this? This is h bar over 2m. k is again square root of 2me over h bar. So this is square root of 2me over h bar. So V quantum mechanical is given by square root of the energy over twice the mass of the particle. Does this make sense? Well, let us look at what a classical velocity is. For a classical particle, for a classical particle, energy is simply one half m V classical squared. If you rearrange this, you will see that V classical is square root of 2E over M, okay? Now multiply this top and bottom by two and you would actually find that this is twice the quantum mechanical velocity that we have here. So there is something funky going on. So if you look at this and this, why is it that in the quantum mechanical case, the wave that is supposed to represent the particle has a velocity only half the velocity of its corresponding classical counterpart. 
if the wave is to describe the particle in some sense, then it should be traveling with the same velocity as the corresponding particle is traveled. This also raises a third subtlety. So I've been loosely saying that the wave is supposed to represent the particle, but this actually makes no sense. Why? Because a wave is an extended object, right? It, 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 it's there all over space, but a particle is a localized object. Particle is localized. Waves are not. Waves spread out, they're everywhere in space. So where is the particle in quantum mechanics? Where is this particle that we are talking about? After all, we are writing the Schrodinger equation for a particle. Why? Because the Schrodinger equation necessarily has, so if you go back, a mass here. Right? So this is the Schrodinger equation for a particle of mass m moving in some potential v of x. But in this picture, where is the particle? We have written down a wave function. The wave function is basically a free wave. It's everywhere in space. So even though one can formally understand the solution of the Schrodinger equation, in the case of a free particle, there's a number of subtleties. The first subtlety is the fact that the wave function is not normalizable. Um, so this is the same problem we had, for example, for momentum space eigenfunctions. And I mentioned at that time that we will encounter the exact same problem in free particles, because obviously free particle is also a momentum space eigenfunction. The second uh, subtlety is that the velocity of the wave seems to be only half the velocity of the corresponding classical particle. The third subtlety is the idea of localization, where is the particle? Okay, so we'll try to understand these subtleties one by one. But whatever it is, at this point, it is kind of clear that the solutions that we have, these separable solutions, at this point, the conclusion is that the separable solutions that we have do not represent physical states. They cannot represent physical states because they are not normalizable in the first place. Okay? All right. So we will again appeal to the general program of solving the time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation and try and see if that can fix one or more of these problems. So remember I told you that we have, we have still not done the summation over n in this uh, construction of the general solution. So I don't want the specific solution, the specific separable solution, which in my case, I'll put a k at the bottom because this uh, is a wave with some wave number k is a exponential i k x minus h bar k over 2m times t. So this is not the most general solution. The most general solution is a linear combination of all these separable solutions. So the general solution is a linear combination of these separable solutions. And if the energy terms are to be discrete, then the linear combination is a linear sum. But if the energy terms are to be continuous, like in the case of the free particle, the uh, linear combination is a integral over the continuous variable. And the continuous variable in this case is k. So the general solution of the free particle is psi capital psi of x comma t equals some one over root two pi that I will add for convenience minus infinity to infinity. Now remember the CNs, the expansion coefficients are now continuous functions. They are not discrete functions. And if they're continuous, what should they depend on? They should depend on k because that is a corresponding continuous variable. So I'll call this continuous variable as some phi of k. e to the i times this whole thing, kx minus h bar k square over 2mt times dk. Okay. So recall, recall for the discrete case, psi of x comma t 
is n cm sin of x e to the minus i e n t over h bar. Okay, so this c n the discrete uh, sorry so this uh, discrete sum is replaced by an integral over the continuous variable. The discrete coefficient c n are now replaced by a continuous function of x uh, of of k. The sin of x is basically your e to the i k x and e to the minus i e n t over h bar is the h bar k square over k n times t part. Okay. And the integral is over d k, just like the sum is over n. So there is a formal correspondence between these two. For the discrete case, it is a sum over the discrete states. And for the continuous case, the general solution is basically an integral over all possible eigenfunctions with every possible value of k. Okay, so how do I fix the expansion coefficients phi of k? I'll fix them exactly the same way as I fixed it in the uh, discrete case. So remember that I should be given what psi of x comma zero is the initial condition, right? What is psi of x comma zero? I will fix phi of k by demanding that this function, whatever it is that is given to me, is equal to this formula evaluated at time t equal to zero, which is nothing but square root of two pi minus infinity to infinity phi of k e to the i k x d k. Okay, so this function psi of x comma zero is given to me. Okay, so I'll use this to evaluate. So let me call this function psi of x comma zero some, let us say um, phi of x. Okay, so phi of x is one over square root two pi minus infinity to infinity phi of k e to the i k x d k. And to extract what my expansion, so remember that this is given to me because this is the initial condition psi at uh, time t equal to zero. I need to figure out what phi of k is. To do this, I will simply use the fact that the uh, momentum eigenfunctions are orthogonal even though they are not normalized remember that the functions e to the i k x are orthogonal uh, if i integrate e to the i k x times e to the minus i k prime x i get a delta function in k and k prime so i can use that fact multiply both sides by e to the minus i k x and integrate and i will actually get that phi of k would simply be one over square root of two pi integral minus infinity to infinity phi of x e to the minus i k x dx. Okay. So this is using the fact that e to the i k x are orthogonal functions. Okay, even though they are not normalizable thus far, uh, they are still orthogonal. Uh, in the sense of the delta function uh, orthogonalization that we discussed in the last module, okay? So exactly like we do it for the discrete case, there is a very simple program that tells you what the expansion coefficients phi of k are. So now I'm ready to write down the most general solution for the free particle because I know how to uh, write down what the uh, expansion coefficients are. So I know exactly what psi of x comma t is. The most general solution psi of x comma t is basically one over root two pi integral minus infinity to infinity phi of k e to the i k x minus h bar k square over two m t dk. Okay, so this is the most general solution that we are going to be looking at. And unlike this guy, unlike, uh, let's call this equation three, which is not normalizable, equation four is actually normalizable. Why? This time, if I do psi star psi, I simply don't have all the um, functions um, 
So the, it's not purely a face like e to the i k x. So even the e to the i k x part disappears. The phi star phi part remains. So this is proportional to phi star k phi k, right? Integrated over d k. So as long as the phi k's are properly chosen, uh, given the initial initial condition, this phi function capital phi of x comma t is actually normalizable. So given that we construct the general solution in the proper way, I can always choose my phi of k such that equation four, the wave function, the most general solution of a free particle is a normalizable wave function. So these represent physical states. The separable solutions do not represent physical states. Okay, as a curious mathematical fact, uh, if two functions are related by such uh, a transformation that phi of x is integral phi of k to the i k x and phi of k is integral phi of x e to the minus i k x dx, they are said to be Fourier transforms of each other. Okay, so phi of x, um, so phi of k is the Fourier transform of phi of x, and phi of x is called the inverse Fourier transform of phi of k. <coughs> if you have done Fourier transforms in your mathematics courses, uh, you would immediately recognize this. If not, you will certainly study it in your other courses. Don't worry about it. So we have solved the normalization problem. Yeah but we have not yet solved the other two problems, the curious case of the velocity of the wave and where is the particle. But remarkably enough, this general formula four also gives us an answer to the other two questions. To understand how it gives an answer to the other two questions, let us understand first of all, what equation four is. Equation four is not just a single wave, but it is a superposition of all possible solutions with all possible values of k, okay? So if I only have, let us say, two solutions with uh, k1 and k2, then it is a simple addition, right? So superposition. So let us say that we have uh, two waves and you're adding them, right? So I'm going to write psi of, okay. So psi of x comma t, let us say is psi one of x comma t plus psi two of x comma t. Okay, remember that equation four is the most extreme version of this uh, equation five, where I have infinite number of k, so I'm, I'm adding infinite number of size, basically and integrating over instead of adding. But let me take the case of a very, very simple example of just adding two waves with two different k values and try and motivate how this solves the other two problems that we raised. So let's say that these two waves have the same amplitude, but they have different wave numbers and frequencies. Okay, so let's write psi one of x comma t as sine k one x minus omega one t. Okay, I can always choose it to be sine or cosine or whatever it is, the, those details don't matter. And psi two, I will choose to be sine k2x minus omega 2t. So I'm assuming that they both have the same amplitudes. So I would just call the amplitude one. So that part is not very relevant to what I'm going to be discussing. So what if I add these two? Psi of x comma t is going to be sine k1x minus omega 1t plus sine k2x minus omega 2t. Okay. So now we will do some uh, trigonometric jugglery. So I'll use the formula that sine A plus sine B can be written as two cosine A minus B over two times sine A plus B over two. Okay, so using this, I can write my capital Psi of X comma T as two cosine a minus B, so A is K1X minus omega 1T and B is K2X minus omega 2T. So this would be K1 minus K2 divided by two times X minus omega 1 minus omega 2 divided by two times T times sine of the addition of these guys. So this is K1 plus K2 over 2X 
minus omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2 times t. Okay. So it's hard to keep writing this over and over again. So I will introduce some uh, shorthand. So I'll call k bar as 1 half k1 plus k2. And I'll call delta k as 1 half k1 minus k2. And similarly, I'll call omega bar equals 1 half omega 1 plus omega 2. And I'll call delta omega as 1 half omega 1 minus omega 2. Okay. With this shorthand, I can write my combined wave, which is a linear superposition of these two guys as 2 times cosine delta k x minus delta omega t times sine k bar x minus omega bar So thus far, we have simply assumed that we, have, we are simply adding two waves with wave numbers k1 and k2 and frequencies omega1 and omega2. Now, let me make some assumptions. The assumption that I'm going to make is that the wave numbers that we are adding are actually pretty close to each other. That k1 is approximately equal to k2, which means delta k, which is k1 minus k2, is very close to zero. In other words, delta k is very, very small than either k1 or k2, okay? What does this mean then? So remember that this is now a, the, the linear superposition of these two waves is now a product of two different waves. A cosine wave with some velocity and a sine wave with some velocity, okay? Now, don't worry about the cosine part and the sine part. That simply is because of the... Uh, is because of the choice that we started with, uh, that both of them are sine waves. Uh, but the important point is that it is now a product of two different waves. One that has some velocity. What is the velocity? So I can, if, if I rewrite this, so I have x comma t, two cosine, uh, suppose delta k times x minus delta omega over delta k times t times sine k bar x minus omega bar over k bar times t. Okay. So this is a product of two waves. The first one seems to be traveling with a velocity delta omega over delta k. The second one seems to be traveling with a velocity uh, omega bar over k bar. Let's try to understand the magnitude of these velocities. Remember that Delta k is a very small number, right? So remember that lambda is 2 pi over k. It's inversely related to the wave number. So the first guy and the second guy have remarkably different wavelengths. If k1 is approximately equal to k2, such that delta k is very small, the first uh, guy has a very large wavelength, so lambda L is 2 pi over delta K. Why? Because delta K is very small, so this number 2 pi over delta K is a very large wavelength. And the second guy has a very short wavelength, 2 pi over K bar, because K bar is a large number. So del, uh, 2 pi over delta K by our assumption that K1 is approximately equal to K2 is necessarily much longer than the other wave. So we have a very curious uh, kind of wave that is traveling. One guy, so this is a product of two waves. One wave has a very long wavelength. The other wave has a very short wavelength. So the product of these two looks something like this. And this is my attempt at drawing this. So forgive me if this is not looking really good. So let me first draw the axis. Okay. Now, the first one is again a wave, but a very short wavelength wave. So, and remember that if I add two waves, the other thing that I'm going to introduce is interference, right? So there are going to be parts where the two waves are going to add uh, constructively, and there are going to be points at which the two waves are going to be adding destructively. 
So, oops. So I'm gonna look something, I'm gonna get something like this. So what are these wave motions? So let me draw the envelope of the wave with a shorter wavelength. Use a different color. So if I draw this like this, again, my drawing is not either up to scale or up to par, but I hope you get the general idea. Okay, so what's happening is the fact that there is a wave with a very short wavelength, that is the guy in blue that is doing rapid oscillations. And there is a wave that with a larger wavelength, that is the guy in red, that is enveloping the small wavelength guy. Okay. And the guy with a large wavelength is traveling with a velocity um, that is different from the velocity of the uh, guy with a shorter wavelength. So remember that instead of, so we started with the notion of waves, but now we seem to have created out of this wave, this linear superposition of these two waves gives me a very nice picture in which I have a small region in which there is a wave and then there is a, a region in which the two waves destructively interfere. So there is nothing there. And then there is another region in which the wave is, uh, pops up again. So this defines the notion of what are called packets of waves or wave packets. Okay. Wave packets are basically packets of waves. That is, that is all they are. So this, uh, the formation of these wave packets hinges on, the, on two different things. The first and the most important thing is that this is an addition of two or more waves. So whenever you add waves, you're gonna have interference, parts where the amplitudes destructive, uh, parts where the waves destructively uh, add, parts where the waves constructively add. So this is gonna give rise to meant regions in space where the wave has zero amplitude and regions in space where the uh, wave has a maximum amplitude. Two, the overall picture is going to look like something that is oscillating very fast and something that is oscillating slower that is enveloping the other guy that is oscillating very fast. And obviously these two guys travel with different velocities. What are these velocities? Well, this this sine portion is traveling at a velocity omega bar over k bar, and the cosine portion is traveling with a velocity delta omega over delta k. So let's call these different way, uh, names. I'll call the omega bar over k bar as VP. I'll call this the phase velocity. This is the velocity of. Um, the guy traveling with uh, uh, lambda equal to two pi over k bar. And I'll call Vg, which is delta omega over delta k as the group. Group velocity. There is two different velocities, okay? So what are these two different velocities? Velocity. One is the phase velocity, which is given by omega bar over k bar, and uh, velocity two is given by the group velocity. So remember that when you construct a wave packet, this is the second lesson we learned. When you construct a wave packet, you're necessarily dealing with the convolution of many waves, and there are different velocities with which the different components travel. There is two different velocities. The velocity with which the envelope of these waves travel, 
and the velocity with which the uh, components inside travel. Okay, all right. So let us go back to um, the uh, part, uh, free particle situation and look at what the wave packet is and figure out what the phase velocity and group velocity are. So the most general solution that we wrote down is basically square root of two pi minus infinity to infinity phi of k exponential i times kx minus h bar k square over 2m t dk, right? So this is not just a very simple addition of two waves. It is a linear superposition of an infinite number of functions with infinite number of values of k, right? So what is my omega in this case? Remember that E is h bar square k square over 2m. And if I equate this to the energy h bar omega, I can write my omega as h bar k square over 2m. So this guy that you see in the exponent is basically an omega. So I can equally well write this psi of xt equals 1 over root 2 pi Phi of k exponential i kx minus omega t dk. That looks very simple. So what is the phase velocity and what is the group velocity? Well, the phase velocity is simple enough to define, which is vp is just omega over k. Okay, what is this omega over k? This is nothing but omega is h bar k square over 2m h bar k square over 2m divided by k. So this is h bar k over 2m. Remember that this h bar k over 2m is basically the velocity of the quantum mechanical wave that we discussed over here. So this guy, okay? So this, is, this was the origin of the other confusion that we have. Why is it that the quantum mechanical wave is traveling at a velocity less, in fact, half of the corresponding classical particle? Uh, in fact, when we simply write down the wave, all we are looking at is just the phase velocity. But what we should in general do is write down a linear superposition and understand how the envelope of the wave travels. And that you associate with the particles. The group velocity of this wave or this wave packet rather, is delta omega over delta k. Now, unlike in our previous example where there were just two omegas and two k, so it was very easy to define delta omega and delta k, we are, in, in this case, we are adding an infinite number of waves with an infinite number of k's. So I can approximate delta omega over delta k as d omega dk. Okay, what is d omega dk? Well, omega is h bar k square over 2m. So vg, which is d omega dk, so that I got from here, is nothing but h bar k over m. And if you work it out, this, the phase velocity is exactly equal to the quantum mechanical velocity of the wave that we discussed earlier. And the group velocity Vg is the corresponding velocity of the classical particle. So the group velocity is the one that you should associate with the classical velocity of the particle and not the phase velocity. The phase velocity is twice the quantum mechanical velocity or twice the group uh, phase uh, group velocity is twice the phase velocity in the case of the free particle. Very good. So we have constructed the most general superposition of states and that has solved our normalization problem. As a byproduct, it has also solved our confusion as to what I should regard as the velocity. The velocity of the particle should be associated with the velocity of the uh, envelope or the group velocity and not the phase velocity. So previously I was incorrectly working with phase velocity and that's why I had a confusion. 
So the linear superposition naturally gives rise to two different kinds of velocities and there's a group velocity that should be identified with the velocity of the corresponding classical particle. But what about the last question? Where is the wave? Uh, where is the particle? We have still not answered that because the wave packet, if you simply take this particular picture as a wave packet, uh, is still a non-localized object in space, right? So there is multiple points at which the amplitude destructive interferes. You do get packets of waves, but you get many, many, many packets of waves. Right now, just one packet of wave. So I cannot construct something localized out of this. Can I? It turns out I can. See, remember that this picture is only the addition of two waves. But this superposition is a sum over an infinite number of waves. So by carefully choosing my phi of k's, I can arrange for this infinite sum to look like something that vanishes everywhere, not just at specific points, but everywhere, except at very, very small intervals of x. In other words, I can construct a wave, wave packet, that doesn't look like uh, the one that I drew before with just two waves, but instead is actually a localized object that looks like this. My iPad is giving me problems. And the envelope of this guy is just this. This is, and this is travel. This. So I can choose my coefficients such that the wave packet is only a localized object and doesn't look like this. This is only a uh, if I, if I add any finite number of waves, I, there's no way I can get something like this. Why? Because I have to choose the coefficients very carefully such that they cancel out everywhere except in some small region of space. So with a finite number of waves, this is not possible. But luckily for us, the free particle is a continuous system. So it is characterized not by a discrete variable, but by a continuous variable that can take on an infinite number of values. So the general solution is a linear superposition of all these infinite number of solutions. So I can always, so with an infinite number of waves, I can always choose my coefficients phi of k such that the wave packet is a localized object in space. In space. So I can construct something local out of something that is spread out by carefully arranging the coefficients such that they cancel out everywhere, such that they uh, interfere destructively everywhere except in some small region of space. And this small region of space, I will later claim, is the region where the particle is localized. Okay, so this simple idea of linear superposition of states, the fact that the separable solutions themselves are not physical states, leads us to the notion that one should construct a general solution that is a linear superposition of all such stationary solutions. And in the case of the free particle, this is absolutely vital because it solves many of the subtleties that arise out of a very simple analysis of the separable solutions. The separable solutions are not normalizable. They represent something that is traveling at a very different velocity than uh, corresponding to the classical particle. And you have no idea where the particle is because the waves are not local. But if you construct a general solution, which is the linear superposition of all the separable solutions with a label by a continuous index k, a careful choice of the expansion coefficients can render something that looks like a localized wave packet. So we can identify that with the corresponding classical particle and whose velocity exactly matches, whose group velocity exactly matches with the velocity of the classical particle. And the general linear superposition is also a normalizable wave function and thus represents physical states, okay? So this is the program that we discussed initially is, is of uh, crucial importance because it, uh, it lets us construct this general solution that solves or throws light on all these different subtleties 
And basically most of these subtleties arose because we were interpreting the wave function that we had as the most general wave function. And that was an incorrect um, explanation. And the correct explanation is to construct the most general linear superposition of all these separable solutions, which will finally represent the correct quantum mechanical understanding of what a free particle is. Okay? So we'll stop this module at this point.